Hero versus villain. Are you a hero? Are you praying for God? Are you on your knees? Let me bring that all back around. Are you standing up for him? Are you being the hero you've been called to be? Or right now, are you a villain? A person that's not doing a single thing for the Lord. But what's a hope for us is that maybe we're that guy in the middle like a David who was heroic at times and a villain at times. Times he did things totally selfish and for himself. But a hero will get back and say, Lord, how did I get here? How did I get so far away from you? Please forgive me. God can forgive us. So which side are you on or are you in the middle? I pray that you're on the heroic side. I would love to say this church is ready to tackle whatever the Lord has because I can guarantee there's some sweet people here. I love being around you. It is a joy being in your presence. I've been in churches that chew you every time you walk in and walk out. That's not this church. Sweet, sweet people, and I love all of you. But we need to stand up and be heroic. I want us to be able to talk about you and you and you and you and you for all the things you're doing. Let me tell you what this person in my church did. Let me tell you I'm blessed to be around these people because they're doing this and this and this for the Lord. It's an exciting place. I can't keep up with them. That's the kind of people we need to be. So you're a hero or a villain. Our overall passage is in the book of Romans. And I want you to say this with me. Romans verses 1 and 2. You ready? Now we who are strong have an obligation to bear the weaknesses of those without strength and not to please ourselves. Each one of us must please his neighbor for his good to build him up. That's the kind of people we need to be. Are you strong enough that you're doing that? Are you building your neighbor up? The reason we have strength is because the Lord is in us. There should be nothing that we cannot conquer it without him. He can tear everything up in his name. We've just got to do that with him. We've got to agree that we're going to be that conduit, that person that does these mighty things for him. The sad thing in this world is many people don't like others to have position. Some of the, the, the cancer that's in America today is this trying to balance out everyone to have the same amount of money and the rich can't have it, I need to take this, the reallocation of funds, the reallocation of resources to those who aren't willing to work as hard as those who've attained it. It's a sad story. Many people don't want people to have position. It's an epidemic here in America. You can't hardly watch anything without somebody wanting to take someone else's things. Everyone wants money and power, but many don't want to work for it. It's a sad story. I mean, we should be blessed to have those people around us that can show us how to, to earn wealth and to attain and to earn position so that we can influence other people with those resources. It takes decades, if you're a military man, Jeff's a military man, it takes decades to work your way up in the military, but with that time you've got experience to lead other men in a, in a beautiful way. You can't put somebody into the position of lieutenant colonel in the first year. It takes years to get there where you can lead other people and show them how it is and, and have enough education and background to guide them where they can be great people for their, for their work. And even if you're in the church, the same thing for the Lord. We, didn't, we don't want generals to have been the first year after they come out of school to be moving into generals. We don't want that. They should work their time up and spend time learning what it is to truly be a leader. Why is it that many parents who've uh, given their their businesses or their, uh, their occupations or whatever over their children, their children tend to ruin it. Have you seen that story happen? The parents make this beautiful business and the children ruin it? Well, it's because the parents paid the, the, paid the penalty. They paid the debt. They worked hard week after week, year after year, sacrificed. Their children never had to go through that. Therefore, they don't understand what work is. They don't understand what true sacrifice is. Now, there are examples of the 1920s and 30s who took their parents' fortunes and made multi-million, billion-dollar fortunes. But for the most part today, we want it easy and we don't want to work for it. Just because you think you can lead or manage doesn't make it so. Simple enough. Just because you think you can be pastor doesn't make it so. I've had 20 years of understanding and hearing, complaining and griping to be able to put up with it. Please understand that's the hardest part of the whole ministry is just listening to the griping. You know, you just got to get your scales a little tougher. When I moved into the ministry, I thought this is going to be the best job in the world. Everybody loves everybody. We always talk about Jesus. Yeah, you find out that's about 4% of the job, and the rest of it's wrangling everything else, and it shouldn't be that way. But it's amazing how you learn through those things. But just because you can lead and manage doesn't make it so. There's an article out of Forbes that talks about the 10 qualities of a leader. Now, do you have these? Listen to these. Do you have honesty? A great leader is going to be an honest person. 
all the time they're going to say what's good. Their ability to delegate. This is probably the hardest position in ministry. A good minister is always giving his job away. Always. You're trying to grow new leaders to do the work. As soon as you get this thing settled, you find a new person that can take it. Okay. Even if you love it, you have to give it away. You've got to be able to delegate. Communicate. How many times have we gotten in trouble because we can't speak clearly and make ourselves known well? Sense of humor, this is something I've grown over the years. I'm still not good at it, you know, not because not I can tell a knock-knock joke. But being able to laugh at yourself, you know, that's one of those things I think age is just lets us get there. I used to take myself pretty seriously. If I made a mistake, no one ever heard about it. Now I know I make a few mistakes a year, and so I can talk about those couple things, okay? And that was, there should have been no laughing. That was serious. Confidence, you need to have confidence. You need to have commitment, When you're going to do this thing, we're going to stick into the end. And that's one of the problems you've got with me as a person who works with you is because if the Lord tells us as a church where to go, we're going to die getting there. I can guarantee we're going to all die to get to that thing because we will not stop until we're finished. That's that's one of those things you've got to have. Positive attitude. You need to be upbeat. Yes, the world is a dark place, but this place is beautiful. So if all I can have is a beauty in this room or in my family home, It's enough to get me through the dark times that are ahead. Creativity. Most of the great business leaders are creative. They think out of the box. I have trouble staying in that box. I'm a box guy. I'm an engineer. I like everything to work out. Here's the formula you use. So my wife helps stretching my box all the time to be in a very different shape. It's more like a polygon or something at this point. Intuition. What's happening? What's going on? How do we get there? What are the trends? I think I feel like we need to go this way. And the ability to inspire. Those are the things that make a great leader. Many want position and leadership responsibility, but not everyone wants to work for it. Today we're going to discuss someone who thought he had it and whether or not God agreed. Okay, we'll see what God says about his thinking of his leadership abilities. We're in the book of Numbers, and so open up there. About the fourth book in, I want you to open up there, written by Moses, somewhere around 1420 B.C. It covers the 40 years of the wandering. I mean, it's a few months short of like 39 and a half years is what we're looking at of the book. Sadly enough, they made the wrong choice and they got to wander in the desert for 40 years. This book details a lot of what happened. And it shows the consequences of disbelief and disobedience to a holy God. What does he think about when you don't do what you're called to do? which is most of us every day at some point we let him down. It's time to let him down less often. It's time to be correct and understand what God wants out of us and do our best to strive for that thing and not just rely on asking forgiveness. But I'm going I'm to take responsibility and start standing up because God wants me to be better. I'm going to read his word more. I'm going to spend time before him. I'm going to get on my knees. Lord, direct me before I get there next time so I won't do this thing. Consequences of disbelief, the consequences are very, very grave, and we don't want those. We're in number 16, so open up your Bible to there. Verses 1 through 3, and I want to honor God's word, please, as we stand. And this is what it says in verses 1 through 3. Now Korah, son of Izar, son of Kohath, son of Levi, son of Dothan, and Abiram, son of Eliab, and On, son of Peleth, son of Reuben, here we go, This is where it gets into information. Took 250 Israelite men who were leaders of the community and representatives in the assembly, and they rebelled against Moses. This is no starting good. They came together against Moses and Aaron and told them, You have gone too far. Everyone in the community is holy and the Lord among them. Why then do you exalt yourselves above the Lord's assembly? Let's pray. Dear Lord, you're mighty, and I thank you for this story, Lord. It's a tragic story. But it's one that we can learn from, Lord. Let us understand that you honor those who work hard for you and diligently. You honor those who are holy and righteous, Lord. And let us be that kind of people for you. We say this in your name. Amen. Please be seated. Excuse me. A little bit of backstory. A rebellion can happen at any time. And I think if we watched any of the news, please watch the news once in a while, you know that rebels and rebellions have been going on around the country even in the last few months. They can happen when things are going great and when things are awful. I mean, just look to Baltimore. It doesn't take much effort to see some of the issues going on there. Or any time any police is involved anywhere, we've got some riot now and legitimate 
actions or they believe they're legitimate to just destroy businesses. Somehow, that's showing that something happened wrong. But let's do more wrong to cause, to not, to tell these people that we don't believe it's right. I've seen churches doing well and someone stands up and challenges authority. I've seen this happen plenty of times. Now it can be for good or bad. It can be. Sometimes the good thing is we need a, a leader to stand up stronger. And one of you comes along and says, James, it's time to stand up, and I'm going to stand up with you, and I'm going to bring a whole bunch of people to help. That's a good kind of rebellion. We need all of you to keep us on our toes, to be everything we can be. Because as a church, I don't want us to get lazy or complacent. We don't have enough time. There's just not enough time. If you don't think the end of the world's coming, it's coming. We've got to be prepared, and we've got to do everything we can for the Lord before he comes back. It could be a 1,000 years could be tomorrow. But I want to say that I left doing everything I could because God loved me and God blessed me and I'm going to use my strength for him. I've seen churches that need help with leaders that rise up. A rebellion can be a good thing. It doesn't necessarily have to be a bad thing. Sadly enough, in America, these are not good. You don't show that you're against something by destroying something. There's no intelligence in that. There's no legitimacy. Again, if our forefathers hadn't have fought back, we would still be part of England paying their king and queen tribute. I heard that Buckingham Palace needs about $250 million in renovations. You and I would be paying for that. Okay? Not that our president's not using that money elsewhere anyway. But we see that we're all paying for it one way or another. But look at this. The Declaration of Independence said this. Whenever any form of government becomes destructive of the ends for which it was established, it is the right of the people to alter or abolish it and to institute new government. Those were our forefathers. They st stood up against evil and tyranny. They gave everything they had, their last ounce of devotion, their resources, their family lands, to protect what we are giving away as fast as we can today. Can't be that kind of people. We need people who will stand up against tyranny. Certain rebellion's good. Most isn't. What happens when someone stands against one of God's leaders? Again, you know, if you've got a problem with me, come on up and tell me. I'm big enough to handle it. But let's see what God thinks about it. Okay, here we go. The first thing I want you to know this morning is a villain is prideful. I've never known too many villains, those who are against God, that aren't really very content with who they are. Let's go back to verses 1 through 3. and Let's skip verse 1 since we've got a lot of names here. Verse 2. 250 prominent Israelite men who were leaders of the assembly got with, uh, got with uh, Korah here. And they rebelled against Moses. They came together against Moses and Aaron and told them, You've gone too far. Everyone in the community is holy and the Lord is among them. Why do you exalt yourselves above the Lord's assembly? They don't like it that Moses and Aaron are the leaders. They want that position. Well, who doesn't want to be the leader? Until you have to get in there. Just listening to the children of Israel's complaints for 40 years. Can you imagine how much older Moses got? Just dealing with that. So it's easy to say, I want responsibility and power until you get there and find out there's a lot of work. This whole story starts negatively. A hero will not usually rally 250 people to his cause. Again, I've had many of you come in with, with some different, different, differing opinion or something. You come one-on-one. -on -one. That's what we're to do. If I've got a trouble with David, I'm going to go to David. I'm not bringing 50 people with me to go to David. I'm going to deal with him, and I'm, I'm going to work that problem out with him before I go anywhere else. A hero doesn't need these other people because righteousness is righteousness. Good is good. Right is right. I don't need this. We should deal with the problem face to face, but Korah brings help. He brings 250, not just men, but prominent Israelite men to get on his side. It wasn't just 250 people, but the leaders of the children of Israel. Now remember that Moses had set up through the, the wise counsel of his father-in-law, he set up all this thing of here's, here's the leader and I've got this person over these people, this person over these people, and then these people have people that are under them so that we know how to work a problem when it gets there. Korah wanted to move right to the top. And it doesn't mean that if he weren't, weren't, weren't dedicated and patient that he couldn't have worked his way up over time. But he wanted Moses' position immediately. Matthew 18, 15, if your brother sins against you, go and rebuke him in private. I expect that out of you. And I expect that out of you among one another. If any of you comes to my office saying, this person, I'm having trouble with this person, my first question will be, what happened when you talked to them? That will be the first question, so expect it. I might as well just write it down. Here it is. Did you answer this thing? If we did, let's go to step two, because Matthew is very clear how we deal with one another. 
Go and rebuke him in private. If he listens to you, you have won your brother. Now, most of us don't like people complaining or, or telling us something we need to do better, and we've got to get back past that. There may be something in our lives that we don't see because we're so blinded to that sin that this person can see in my life and they want more for me. We need to be able to be willing to be, a, a, be confronted by one of our church members who loves us enough to get in that position to do it because it's not easy. It's not easy. I've had friends do that to me and the first thing I do is fight and move away and then I'll come back. Okay, I'm sorry, you were right. You saw me, you loved me, you were willing to, to, to fray our relationship to remind me of who I need to be. That's the kind of people we should be. This is how we deal with problems. We don't bring people in unless they don't change. Matthew 18 goes on and says next time we bring someone else. We start bringing elders. If we can't get this solved after four or five circumstances and, and lists of people, we bring it before the, the whole body. That's how you deal with a problem. That's how I expect us to work through problems. Again, come to me one-on-one. -on -one. If, I, if you won't, I won't listen. Again, if you have a, a big big thing and anything pretty much anybody ever brings to me I bring before the elders this person dealt with this they, they've got a concern for the church we need to talk about it as a group is this something we need to work through or not it doesn't just stay with me I won't kill it right there we're a, we're a body we work together as a group of people Korah gets 250 leaders before ever talking to Moses you know Moses may have had a position that he could have moved him into got him down the road I don't know but what had Moses done up to this point with reference to God's guidance? He'd removed these people from Egypt through God's leadership. Korah hadn't done any of that. He gave them, found them food and water through God's guidance. He'd protected them through the protection of the Lord, organized leadership, listened to their grumblings, and Korah had done none of this, yet he wants responsibility for the whole group. This is a crazy story. But it's too true. How many people out there are like this? He had given, Moses at this point, had given his life for these people. And this is how he gets repaid. And again, we've all felt that way, haven't we? At some point you felt, man, I worked so hard. and Look what they did to me. They stabbed me right in the back the first chance they got. Some of you have been through job positions or something. You work your way up, give your best, and this person who does nothing somehow can find influence with someone above you. We've all been there. We know how that works. Korah believes everyone is holy. This is the essential problem. Everyone can take responsibility for their own lives. But is this how God had set it up? He's essentially saying, we don't need the Levites and I don't need Moses being our religious leaders. That's what he's saying. Now, he is from the tribe of Levi. If anyone should have a focus on God, it should be Korah. But he's saying, I don't need the Levites, I don't need Moses, let us just le rule ourselves or I can probably do a better job. Is this how God set it up? I don't think so. God was very clear how he wanted his people to be taken care of. Moses, you're in charge of them. We can read all the way through the Old Testament, the first five books of the Bible of how God took time to set up his people and set up the order and the structure, the way they're to worship him, the times they're supposed to do it, all the tools and all the references, all the things they're supposed to do. This is how he wanted it. They did not like Moses and Aaron being lifted up as leaders before him. This is what happens when you get some alphas together. Now, I love alphas. I love a whole bunch of tough people who are just want to chew into a project. If you can keep them busy on the project, they won't chew into themselves. And that's a good thing. Keep them, just go away. Here's your project. Go do this thing and just kind of hold on to them and let them go. That's a good thing. I like those kind of people. I want people who are aggressive and get the job done. But the problem with alpha is if they haven't got anything to do, they're going to eventually turn on themselves. You can't have two alpha dogs in the same pack. One's going to be beat down by the other. And this is what we have here. All these people are wanting the power that Moses has. Korah was tired of being Moses. He was tired of Moses being the man and he wanted that position. This essentially shows Korah to be full of pride. He thought he knew more than Moses and Aaron and even possibly God. Did he not know that God set all this up? That he put Moses in the position that he was in? He wasn't just challenging Moses and Aaron, but the way God set everything up. He wasn't content with the design. And there's a great uh, comic book, or if you've watched any of the mov movies, the Marvel movies with Thor. Have you ever seen Loki? Again, I know there's some girls in this room that really like Loki. I think he's so cute. In the Marvel Universe, Loki is the adopted brother of Thor. 
In Norse mythology, he is the god of mischief. And in these movies, he does a little, do, does a little more than mischief. He's always fighting Thor and Asgard, and Asgard the, their, their homeland, for power. He isn't content with his state in life as a stepbrother, as an adopted stepbrother. And he'll take down anyone around him with power because he wants that, yet he's not earned that position. Is that you this morning? Do you want position that's not been given to you? Do you want something quicker and faster than God is willing to give it because you have not learned what you need to learn to get to that point to lead? It takes time. Just being patient is is the hardest thing to learn. You know, I'm, I'm a mover, and I have to relax sometimes because I know the people aren't ready. Okay, let's work this. Let's relax. Age has helped me a little bit. It's calmed me down over the years. Is that you today? Do you want more than God has given you? Do you want something that is not your right? Again, understand that when you get frustrated with wealthy people, oh, well, he can do all that, or he's got all the money, and I can't do anything. If I just had that, well, that's already sinful talk. God gives you what you need. And if you're good with that, he'll give you more. Because God is good. A villain is prideful. We'll go the opposite way this way. A hero is humble. Look at verses 4 and 5 here. When Moses heard this, he fell face down. Then he said to Korah and all his followers, Tomorrow morning the Lord will reveal who belongs to him and who is set apart. And the one he will let come near him, he will let the one he chooses come near him. This is what we see happening. What was the first thing that Moses did? He fell on his face before God. Do you think Korah did any falling on his face before the Lord? I can get guarantee that didn't happen. He just got fed up one day with something Moses did, started grumbling and complaining and talking. How many churches does this sound like? And all of a sudden, he's got a posse ready to take out the pastor. Again, how many churches have I heard like this? So sad because God puts the people right, wrong, and different in positions, whether we like it or not. Whether you like your government or not, the Lord put those people in that position. If you read the New Testament. And wrestle with God on it. Maybe we need to be tempered a little bit. Maybe we need to be put down on our knees. The first thing when I heard that thing, I went to my, the Bible. Please, Lord, give me some wisdom here. I don't know what to do with the Supreme Court. And I don't know what to do with this country. How do I protect your church? Lord, have you already protected your church and you haven't told me yet? That was the first thing I did. So Moses falls on his face. He didn't stand up in defiance. But he went to God. Psalm fifty-one, seventeen: the sacrifice pleasing to God is a broken heart. God, you will not despise a broken and humbled heart. That's the kind of person that God rewards. God will never have good things for those who fight against what he wants. This is what Korah should have done. He was the tribe of Levi. If anyone should have understood God's heart. Now, he was not in the priestly line of Levi, but he was part of the tribe of Levi. He should have done everything he could to say, what, God, what do you want from me? His whole life should have been thinking about God's will. Sadly, he was more focused on himself than what God wants. Korah wants to essentially be lead priest. And he has not been put in that position. Is that you this morning? Are you so tunnel focused on your pet projects or the things you want in life that you've lost the sight of what God has for you, the desires that He wants for you? It is sure easy to get off track by the things of the world. It sure is. You know, this new job, got a new position. How many times have I heard people come to me and say, I've got a new job position that's going to keep me away from church? What's asked? Does that sound like God in the first place? God's going to keep you away from the things of His work? Does that sound like Him? I don't know. That's something you can wrestle with. But God should bless you in such a way that you can still do the things He's called you to do. I've just heard it too many times and it breaks my heart because I just know we're going into trouble. Those families tend to start chasing after money. They start getting all these nice things and all of a sudden they're just on vacation more than they're in church. They've forgotten what it means to sacrifice and to give to the church because now they've got all the debt they need the money for. It's just a never-ending cycle. God will not keep you away from the things He's called you to by giving you more cash. He won't do it. I've seen churches do this. You're so tunnel-focused on what you want that you're not thinking about the greater good. As a country, that's us today. We're voting our pocketbook every time we go into the into vote. I mean, that World War II generation would have never done that. They sacrificed everything they had for us. And yet we're giving this freedom away left and right. 
Again, we're voting for our social security, which I won't have when I get there. We're voting for these things that aren't going to last. We're voting for this person to give me two, two more percent on my retirement. What about the greater good of the nation? What about sacrificing for our children and our grandchildren? Where did that go? Is it all about me today? Am I just to think about me and only myself? That's not what we're to do. This church split a handful of years ago. You know that. Does God cause a split in the church? Can God bring good out of a split? Sure. God can do anything God chooses to do. But God grows church. He does not divide them. He doesn't. Now, God has blessed us, and I'm blessed to be part of this group of body, this, this body of believers that stayed here and says, we're not going anywhere. This is what God wants for us. We're not part of whatever this uprising is all about. We're going to stand true and be what he's called us to be. And that's a blessing to be part of that church. God can do amazing things through these other things, and I pray for those kind of outcomes. But God's not in a division. A split in the church is always out of selfish pride. It's never because God's causing it. God's not saying the only way I can start this church on the west side is if I split this church, make them all mad, and some of them will run away. They'll start a church over in the place I really want them to go. That doesn't sound like God at all. God says, I'm going to bless this church in such a way, the only way they can grow is if they start themselves somewhere else. I'm going to, I'm going to retransplant some of these sweet people who have been invested in this body of believers over here because this is what my will is. This is the great God we serve. We should seek God's face, not our own. In the story here, God tells Moses what he's to do when he's on his face. The first thing you need to do if you want to know what God's will is, why don't you get on your knees? Why don't you close your eyes and say, Lord, just tell me. He wants to tell you how to live your life. He wants to tell you the good things are coming. At this point, both sides, Moses and Aaron versus the 250, they're all to give to burn some incense, and God will set apart the sacrifices. Again, when you look at humble heroes, if we're looking at kind of our, our uh, comic book realm, uh, you can see Captain America, and I like it. I wish they wouldn't. The new movie even made a few jokes about it. I wish they wouldn't lose some of his 1930, 1940s sentimentality. They make a joke about, you know, he at one point they're speaking all over the radios, and the language gets a little, there's a, a word left, used. And Captain America says, language, watch your language. I like that. I wish America was more concerned with what is right and holy and just holding ourselves and carrying ourselves well. Are we not above these small things? That's something you need to wrestle with. Again, what is it in your life that is, is below where God would have it? There are plenty of things. But he saw the rise of Germany. He wanted to protect freedom from the rise of tyranny. He believed in sacrifice and selflessness. Even in the movies, they still portray him as that way. He's not thinking about himself. He's thinking about the greater good of the nation as a whole. That's what Korah should be thinking about at this point. Not himself, but what's better for the tribe of Israel at this point. What's better for God's people? Do you put yourself first or do you put the group first? When it comes to this church, where do you think? Where is your focus? Where is your allegiance? God wants us to be a unified, beautiful body that can tear into the world because He needs a people like us, and I guarantee it can happen. We're just that close. So many sweet people with so many gifts and talents in this room. What are you willing to do for Him? It's time to stand up and make it happen. It's time. The world is showing itself, and it's time for the church to rise up. If this Supreme Court decision just gets the church to wake up, then it's all been worthwhile. It's time for us to stand up and be the righteous, holy people in the neighborhood, in the city, in the world. Because God needs that. He has not changed. He still wants a holy people to do His bidding. And we as a church have been too quiet because we've been too happy and complacent. Thinking about ourselves, everything going all right, going good. We need to think about the, the, the Christians being murdered and destroyed over across the world. We need to think about the sin that's coming through the government. Both sides. Pick your side. There's sin all over. Yet God wants us to stand true. A villain's prideful. A hero is humble. And finally this morning, God knows the difference. He does. So Moses makes it clear that Korah is wrong. Go to verse 11 here. He says, therefore, it is you, again, Moses finally stands up. He's gone before the Lord, and there's nothing wrong with a righteous anger. 
Once in a while, I will get frustrated. Usually I can keep my temperament. I've got my ministerial words. I put the smile on. Let's love each other and just hold hands and sing. Okay? But once in a while, you get beyond that where you are wrong. I love you. But you're in sin here and you need to understand it. I've done that a couple of times in this church. I don't like to. I like to keep to myself and everybody just be happy. But it needed to be done. And this is what happens. Verse 11. Therefore it is you and all your followers who have conspired against the Lord. As for Aaron, who's he that you should even complain about him? Again, don't come to me to complain about Brandon. Go to Brandon. Because I'm going to need immediately to defend Brandon until I know what's going on. You're not helping yourself by coming to me about Brandon. Or any other person that's in leadership. Or any other church member. Because I'm going to defend that person because they're not there. Just for the sake of that. He asks, why are you bringing Aaron into this? Moses takes the role of a leader. He's going to protect Aaron. He's going to protect his people. That's what a great leader does. I've worked for some very poor pastors who threw me out to the wolves every chance they got. And I've worked for one that said, if, you're going to, if they're going to fire you, they're going to, I'm going to go with you. We will fight this thing together. And that's the church that went from 200 to 1,000 in four years. Because we were unified and we were a body that could not be divided. God did amazing things in that church, and that's what I beg for here. It was such a joy to be there. So many people running in all different directions, just using their gifts and talents. What fun! Moses, eventually, he calls for some helpers. Let me tell you the story. But they don't side with Moses because they're on Korah's side. He gets real angry. He becomes angry. He says, disrespect their offerings, God. This is what I want you to do with these people over here. Don't even listen to their offerings. He gets frustrated, but he eventually comes back and he tells everyone to bring their incense to God and God's going to work it out. So the whole community comes before the tent of meeting. The tent of meeting was where the Lord is. What a scary place. All of these people come before God and God's going to sort it out. Very much like the story we had this morning of I and that one person who kept the, the sin, kept the sin in his tent. The community comes before the tent. Everyone brings their incense pans to burn before the Lord. Now understand this is where God meets and Korah is bringing a mob before God. Do you think that's going to go well? It's just not going to be a good time for these people. It's not because that's not how God works. God works through a humble and contrite heart, not through anger and not through force and not through pride. If you ever want to bring an uprising against this church, I pray that you are on the right side because God will deal with you. I've seen it before. And it may not be because we're necessarily right, but because your heart is not right. We're just doing our best. Maybe we're off a few degrees. We need a little correction. Maybe we're not listening to everything that's coming along. But come with a humble heart. Korah brought a mob. Verse 21. Separate yourselves from the community so I may consume them instantly. This is what God says. This mob becomes before the tabernacle, the tent of meeting. And God says, you better watch it because I'm going to destroy them all right here. That is the God that we serve. He hates sin just as much today as he did at this time. Understand Christ came to give us life. He gave us redemption, but God is still the same. He hates sin and he hates anything that will distract his people from the calling they have. Are you in sin and is God frustrated right now? Is God trying to get you back and remind you of who you need to be? Moses at this point has to intercede because God's going to wipe them all out. He is sick of it. He has had it with these people. He's going to wipe them all out. But Moses, being the true leader he is, gets on his face. Lord, please. Verses 22. But Moses and Aaron fell face down immediately. God, God of the spirits of all flesh, when one man sins, will you vent your wrath on the whole community? God was going to wipe them out. He's done this already in, the, in this time before. He's already tried to wipe them out. Moses interceded before. God, Moses is doing again. The Lord replied to Moses. Tell the community, get away from the dwelling of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. Moses got up and went to Dathan and Abiram, and the elders have followed him, and this is what happened. Moses got everyone away. Okay, God's not going to wipe everyone off, off the face of the earth, just those who caused the trouble. He tells them to move away. Don't touch anything that Korah or Abiram or these other guys own. Don't even just walk away, get away, because it's about to be a bad scene. He says, if they die, Moses is very clear. If you die of old age, then I was wrong. But I don't think I'm wrong. I don't think I am. I'm doing what God's called me to do, whether I like it or not. I'm in the position that God's given me. Look at verses 31, moving on through the story. 
Just as he's finished speaking, he was telling everybody, now understand, either you're right or I'm right, but God's going to work it out. As he finished speaking all these words, the ground beneath him split open. The earth opened its mouth and swallowed them and their households, all Korah's people, and all their possessions. They went down alive into Sheol with all that belonged to them. The earth closed over them and they vanished from the assembly. They went essentially to hell. That's what Sheol represents in the Old Testament. This is what God thought about that uprising. Everything they had went down with them, except the pans that they burned the incense on. Everything except that. And God's going to use that to make plating for the altar. Every time they see that altar, they're going to remember Korah. Every time. You remember what happened? Every time you come before me, you're going to see what I, what I did to those people. You need to be my people and no one else. They were plating for the altar. It's amazing how one person can cause discontent among a group. I've seen it in a church. We read too many happenstance stories in the Old Testament, even the New Testament about this. All it takes is one person to stand up, and for some reason everybody starts listening. Sin is sin, and right is right, and wrong is wrong. At this point, the people were afraid, but not afraid enough that they remembered even 24 hours later. Because... They, they ran away, terrified of what happened to Korah and his group. But 24 hours later, they come back before Moses, saying the same things. Who are you that ought to be leading us? They come back again. Did they not learn the lesson? Did God not just show himself? This is what happens here at this point. Moses and Aaron turn to the Lord face down. They're at the tabernacle. This is where God is. They're face down before him. And God is angry because all of these people have come back. Did they not learn their lesson and understand that they need to be a repentant people? At this point, God comes in a cloud and he tells Moses, I'm going to destroy them again. I gave them a 24-hour period. They tended to forget. I'm going to destroy them all now. I've had it with them. Understand this, God has not changed. He hates sin just as much. He will protect you and, and God's people and this church just as violently as he did back then. Because God does not put up with things that are apart from his will. So what happens? 24 hours later coming back, God says, I'm going to destroy him. But Moses immediately intercedes. He tells Aaron, get, get a pan. Start going all the, because this cloud is coming and it's starting to envelop the people. The people are getting a plague. They're starting to drop like flies. And Moses is on his face interceding before here. Aaron, get this, get this pan. Go over there in the middle of the people and burn, a, burn an incense for the Lord. And maybe he'll forgive these people and stop what they're doing. Maybe he won't destroy them. This is a great leader. All these people are against him and he's not concerned about what they're thinking. He's concerned about their life. He's concerned about the bigger picture. I need these people. So Aaron runs over there. He adds incense. He stands between the sick and the dead and the plague is halted. All of a sudden when Moses got that thing burning guarantee, he's got that flint out there. How do I get this match? Oh my goodness. Oh, I see. Oh God, please help me. Help me get this fire. All of a sudden it stops. 14,700 people die that day because of the leadership of one man, Korah. One man caused 14,700 people to die. Are you going to be that easily drawn off? doesn't take much. I need you to be God's people. I need you to be. Has God called you to leadership? And if he has, what a blessing. I need you to tell me about it. My job is to use your role, your leadership. My job is to use your talents and your gifts to somehow bless through everyone else. So if there's something you want to do, you need to come to me because I'm praying every day, Lord, please let me use the people the best I can. I want to do that. But are you wanting something that's not yours? This church has had a split. We know what that looks like. If you've been in churches like that, so at some point somebody wants something they're not supposed to have. It's not going to happen again. It's not. We need to continue to be the sweet people that we are. Right now we are very happy, and I love that. Now, if you're not happy, okay, I'm, you may be the one. Come on into my office. We'll gripe about it a little bit. But for the most part, we're a happy, contented people, and I love that. I love it. It's a joy to be here. But it doesn't take but one little tiny spark to start a forest fire. You don't want to be that spark. You don't. Please always think before you speak. Show grace. Show kindness to the people around you. Be straight. Tell them you're having trouble. Tell them things are going on. Tell them there's more for your life here than you're wanting. 
I want to show you what you can be and what God can do through you. But don't be the spark that draws people away and destroys a work that God's about to do. This church is on the edge, and we're about to do great things. If you're willing to be one of those people that helps lead this group,